Hello and welcome to the 15th in my series of CPD Coffee Times with me, Dr. Tina Ray. Today we're going to focus on ways to recovery through a toolbox of well-being. Many of you will know me as a psychologist. I currently work for Fostering Agency and also in many other different contexts, focusing primarily on children, young people's mental health and well-being, which has been my passion for many years. And I also write extensively, producing a range of user friendly, practical resources for teachers, else as those working in the caring profession. So you'll find many of my publications with Nurture UK, which is my favourite charity. So we write extensively for the wonderful Sarah Miles at Hinton House Publishers and I'm going to make reference specifically today to many of our publications with a particular focus on the new wellbeing toolbox for wellbeing, sorry, the toolbox for wellbeing and hopefully um, you will see that these are really user friendly resources and at this current time during the pandemic when we are attempting to develop our recovery curriculums um, I'm hoping that many of the ideas particularly from some of the slides here and some of the resources will help you in terms of actually developing and moving forward with this recovery curriculum, which I think is an absolute essential now for all our children and young people as we progress through this pandemic and reintegrate them back gradually into the school context. So my current focus here is on just highlighting today, I think, some of the difficulties that children and young people and ourselves as the adults who are nurturing them may face, but also to really flag up some of the really positive things that we can do and some of the strategies and tools that really are user friendly and effective and evidence based. Um, so hopefully in this session, by the end of it, you will go away feeling slightly more hopeful and knowing that there are lots and lots of different resources and things that you can use out there. Um, you don't have to reinvent the wheel here. So my impetus initially in creating the toolbox for well-being or the toolbox of well-being was primarily a conversation that I heard a few months ago on my normal usual walk in Faversham where I live in Kent um, and just you know overhearing a child with his mum and as they were walking up the hill there were two little boys together but I think the eight-year-old was saying to his mum you know why do you have to go to work I don't want you to go and worried you'll get the virus and you can see and, and hear in his little voice this real level of anxiety and fear and separation anxiety potentially clearly and she was wonderful with him very calm but you know he was saying I, I think you might get the virus you, you're going to die um, and she's ba basically saying but we'll all day, die one day I'm just being very very careful so you mustn't worry and he said I feel so sick when you go you might not come back I think we should just all stay at home we can't be safe anywhere else and I think this really epitomized for me the sense of underlying fear and anxiety that our children and us as adults are clearly having to manage on a daily basis um, until we get a vaccine and until we can ensure that we can all stay safe I think we're going to have to actually live with that and what we need to really be focusing on now is this notion of controlling what we can control and hopefully in this session today I'll begin to show you some of the ways that we perhaps can do that. We know from the Young Minds um, survey undertaken in March of this year that the coronavirus pandemic is and continues to have a profound effect on young people with existing mental health conditions and we know that 83% of them who took part in the survey reported increased anxiety, problems with sleep, panic attacks and more frequent urges to self-harm. So these are really, really concerning um, elements, side effects of this pandemic for those individual children and young people. The Coast by Study at University of Oxford also suggested that like the little boy in my example uh, one fifth of children don't actually feel safe to leave home now so it's it's going to be a big issue for some of them this transition back gradually into the school the learning context conversely you have to factor into your thinking here of course is that that would suggest that four fifths of children do actually feel okay about it and we mustn't forget that for many children young people they will be desperate to get back into school to see their friends they will have missed the socialization 
and they will have missed just being in a learning context and also being taught by wonderful teachers who know exactly how to teach that's their profession so we need to kind of balance this but at the same time not underestimate the level of anxiety I've been talking to friends recently who said that many of the children that have come back into their year six classes seemed absolutely fine at the beginning but after about a week and a half they began to actually articulate some of the underlying levels of fear the anxieties that they had and, and what they were really frightened of and that was ongoing and it, it didn't come out for a few days so I think we've got to remember that some of the stress that they're experiencing is not going to be displayed instantly for some of our children as well it, we mustn't lose sight of the fact that they'll, they'll have had some rather special times during lockdown whereas others will have had some very bad times with high levels of fear and anxiety particularly if they are in rather toxic households and these of course are the children that we're going to have to be very very mindful of um, in terms of the ongoing abuse and neglect that they will have experienced and that's not going to end but clearly we know for some of these children who they are they're well marked and registered in our school system so we can make sure right at the outset that we're there for them that we're providing the bespoke kind of individualized intervention for mental health and well-being that we know they need ultimately I think that you know there are obviously clearly increased levels of anxiety and stress for all of us at this current time what we need to do is to be very careful however not to over pathologize this um, for many of us we are resilient we will be managing it we will be able to reflect to self-care and engage in appropriate self-care we'll be able to be rational and actually challenge our negative automatic patterns of thinking feeling and behaving but for all of us what we really need now is to listen to each other to listen to our children to empathize with each other and our children and ensure that there is a nurturing context there for all of us where we can feel a level of compassion that will help us to build again those meaningful relationships and connections and i think when we are nurturing children back through this recovery curriculum I think what we need to be doing as well is that we, we, we have to factor this into our thinking, that we understand our own past traumas so that we can reflect more deeply on our own feelings and reactions and responses and be very careful and vigilant about not actually um, going down the route of vicarious trauma or compassion fatigue or burnout. Um, we need to be not taking children's behaviour personally. We need to use our calm to soothe them and help them to calm. So we need to support children, and young people to self-regulate, which presupposes that we can do that ourselves. And this is absolutely essential. We know that unregulated, dysregulated adults cannot possibly help to support, to, to un, um, regulate dysregulated children. We need to be mirroring the right behaviours for them and that calming, nurturing response using key tools and strategies from emotion coaching, for example. And I have done a session on that if you wanted to make reference back to it in this series of CPD Coffee Times. So we know that children with developmental trauma will have developed a range of really unhealthy strategies. Um, they believe that these are going to keep them safe. Uh, they function from the primitive brain for much of the time, as we know, and they're developmentally stuck in that primitive brain. They can't actually turn it off, even when they're moved to a safe environment. So what we need to do, all of us now, is be really, really trauma informed here and understand what trauma looks like, not misconstrue it as bad behaviour. We need to also really start at the very bottom and develop safety first. There is this ultimate need for nurture here. So I think the key task at the moment for all of us as educators, psychologists, as those who are nurturing and looking after our children at this time is to create and resource what I call a recovery curriculum in line with Professor Barry Carpenter's and Matthew Carpenter's ideas. And I think this is really, really essential that it is trauma informed. We understand how the brain works. We understand the impact of trauma on the brain and child development overall so that we can actually make sure that we are being totally nuanced in the right way in our responses to children creating a trauma-informed classroom trauma sensitive approaches we also need to be nurturing and put well-being first we need to be catching up with well-being we don't need to be catching up ac academically children will not do that until they feel safe they need to be nurtured and have well-being at the core of everything we do in order to be able to then engage academically again. 
So creating that trauma-informed classroom or creating what Dr. Chris Moore calls a safe base, um, we need the, to, to make sure that we incorporate these six specific keys of belonging, predictability, organisation, regulation, differentiation and relationship. I'm going to go through each of these in turn now. So that belonging, that sense of belonging for our children, those personalised greetings when they come in the door, giving them the jobs, responsibilities, showing them trust and having lots and lots of visual images in classes, entrance corridors, a really happy learning time. So reinforcing what we're here for, the happiness quotient here, the fact that actually we've done so much together and our learning has been fun and we've been successful. And the key to this is that we, is that we are authentic in our interactions and in our ability to ensure that those children feel a sense of belonging, a sense of being part of us as a group together. And being trauma sensitive as well and, and, and ensuring this nurturing classroom is dependent upon us ensuring that everything is predictable. And we do this a lot with children who have attachment disorders and children who have been traumatised. And I now think it's time to make sure that we're doing this for all our children at this current time. They will all benefit from these key tools and strategies. So communicating what the activities are on a daily basis, being very clear, using visual timetables. Visuals are going to be incredibly important now because many of our children will probably have um, compromised working memory deficits as well. That, that's really, really important to factor in. Using countdowns to transitions, pre-warning and reassuring children of each of the changes and making sure that they have access to chill out or preferred activities when they've been doing something that they find harder or more difficult. We're going to need a lot more of that. So kind of working hard, then coming back to do something that's more relaxing, self-soothing. And it may be that they do have access to mindful colouring books or some, some kind of computer time, something that actually is very reassuring to them. Using music, song, visual prompts to aid tidying routines and setting clear orders in cues, transitionings, lining up, etc, etc. And the key to this, again, is be empathic. Do not expect too much. And, and all the time, reinforce, reinforce, reinforce and communicate exactly what is going on throughout the whole of the school day. And in order to support this, I would just highlight the Nurture UK's resource, the Transition Toolbox, which was intended originally for children transitioning from key stage um, two to three, so years six to seven. But actually, lots of these resources will be hugely beneficial now to the children as they transition back into school. Within that resource, you'll find um, a, a format for pupil passport on one of these 60 laminated cards. But I think actually now this might be a thing that we should be doing with all our children as they transition back in and ask each of them to design their own pupil passport. So really identifying their strengths, areas of interest, concerns, barriers to learning, possibly things that they may have found difficult in lockdown, things they're looking forward to, things that would help them, any advice from external agencies, etc. So it might be that now is the time to think about every child having a pupil passport as they transition back in. The third key element to designing and maintaining a trauma sensitive classroom is this notion of organisation. So making sure everything is consistent, consistent seating, which now of course is going to be physically um, distanced in the right way but also everything labelled really, really clearly so that retrieval is easy and the learning is broken down into very clear smaller chunks with possibly equipment lists at the start of the activities, um, very, very clear directions as to what we do first, second, third, fourth, fifth, etc. And again, it's about clarity. The key here is to be clear. And when you're clear, the children who are really hyper aroused will begin to be able to calm down and actually engage. And the key element also here, number four, is regulation. So ensuring that children develop key tools and strategies to self-regulate, to self-soothe, to, to calm down so that they can then engage in the learning that is on offer in the classroom. So again, discussing emotions regularly and normalising these. They're not bad. Some of them are uncomfortable. Um, and also being curious, not furious. It's, that's quite cheesy, I suppose, in a way. But I think it's important. We're curious. We don't want to be furious. We don't want to misconstrue trauma behaviours as being disruptive or just angry. They're not. There's a reason why. There's always an underpinning reason why someone behaves in the way they do. Using puppets as tools. And again, that's safe when we're talking about emotions and feelings. We can talk about how the teddy feels. 
how the, the certain puppet feels and why they're feeling that way and what's happened to them. And, and in a way, that's kind of let, letting the child explore and think about their own emotions in a really safe way. Sensory diets, deep breathing, music, Lego jigsaws, messy play, etc. And calm corners and boxes. And I know that these are difficult now with social distancing, but possibly we need to then think about how a child can take something that a self-soothing object maybe around their neck, something that they keep in a little pouch. But the key here clearly is that we need to be self-regulated first. We can't help children to regulate, as I said earlier, unless we are self-regulated ourselves. And again, just flagging up some of the resources that are out there already in terms of emotional literacy, self-regulation. There's so much stuff, and these are just a few of mine. Um, and I think, you know, possibly just, just have a look. I think there's so much out there now. And I love the idea of calm boxes. I think these are really, really helpful for supporting children to develop self-soothing. And, and what I tend to do is, is get them to put something in from each of their five senses. So something that they can touch, something that they can smell, lavender oil, something that they can see. So a beautiful image, etc., etc. So using the five senses as a framework for this can be very helpful. And again, mindfulness, this is absolutely core, I think, for me and for many of our children and young people. So it may be already that you're using mindfulness. And I have done a session on this in the CPD Coffee Times. So just to flag up there, there are an awful lot of resources. The essential guide I, I am flagging up here because I think it's really rammed full of really practical user friendly resources and ideas for all key stages and also I think sometimes people get stuck in the same old same old thing with mindfulness so this gives you lots of ideas to spice it up and when we're talking about teaching um, children to self-regulate obviously effective thinking is key so I would also refer you to the essential guide to cognitive behavior therapy from Hinton House and again key tools and strategies for all key stages in this little publication. And part of developing that ability to self-soothe and to calm down and to manage strong feelings and emotions is this notion of building resilience alongside that of effective thinking. So two more publications which are really useful. I have to say um, the Building Positive Thinking Habits is absolutely user friendly um, and many of my um, colleagues have used it in, as part of their Year 6-7 transition programme. And of course, what we mustn't underestimate is that many of our children will have possibly experienced um, a loss, a significant loss during this time, and certainly members of the staff team possibly too. Um, and I think we, we also should factor that into our thinking when we are planning any kind of recovery curriculum. So the Bereavement Box from Nurture UK, again, I'm flagging that up too. The resource is entirely user friendly, developed um, over time, over a year and a half actually, um, and 60 cards in three sections focusing on understanding, so understanding the nature of death, the life cycle, the fact it's permanent, etc. Remembering, so a range of activities to help us and support us in, in remembering the loved one and also celebrating how we celebrate. And I think all of those key elements also we, we will be factoring into the recovery curriculum in terms of celebrating the, the, the fact that we're back together again. So I think, you know, a lot of the, the loss is also consistent with the, the sense of loss that children will have experienced, the loss of being with friends, the loss of learning in a classroom context the loss of actually experiencing learning lovely new things with people that we love so I think very importantly that there's a kind of also a parallel here not between individual loss but also between the, the loss that as a group we may have experienced altogether. and I think also just to factor in here what will be important as part of this recovery curriculum is thinking about the systems in the school for um, you as the adults perhaps who are involved in grieving and, and developing a support plan which enables people to really ensure that they have the opportunity to work through and acknowledge their losses, but time and space to think, to grieve, engaging in appropriate self-care routines, and the fact that we need to be actually really using watchful waiting amongst the staff team, looking out for each other and making sure that we're not at risk of vicarious trauma, particularly if we are currently grieving ourselves. So this being observant of everyone in the team is absolutely essential. The fifth element here of a trauma sensitive classroom, of course, is that of differentiation. We know that children who've experienced trauma, who are hyper aroused, have reduced memory and process processing ability. So 
Um, we need to make sure that we keep it simple, that everything is visual and we give children additional time. We're not rushing them. We give them time to process, providing appropriate structures and frameworks and also giving them a level of choice, just a limited choice, but a level of choice and autonomy. And again, the key here is that we obviously need to be organised in order to ensure that that level of differentiation is truly appropriate to the group. We know, of course, that, you know, physical distancing is having a huge impact. And I think we need to be very, very clear that we have to be creative now about maintaining this sixth element of relationship and think about ways that we can do that effectively with those visual cues and signals and hands up and high fives um, visually, obviously. But also, I think just that comfortable proximity, maybe using those transitional objects, which we would do with children who are school phobic or who have anxiety, separation anxiety. Um, also, teaching conflict management skills and building on their personal strengths and interests has to be key and central here. And the real key for us as adults, nurturing adults, is that we need to be kind. Kindness heals. So developing your positive psychology approaches and kindness curriculum at this time, the kindness curriculum, I think, is consistent with recovery. We will get through this and we will recover through our kindness and our meaningful connections and relationships with each other. Some of those positive psychology activities, obviously very, very um, straightforward, I think, very practical. And, you know, it's, it's not um, hugely psychological, I think, in many respects. I think this is about giving psychology away here and being very clear that we can all do this. It's not rocket science. So engaging in appropriate rituals, meditation, forgiveness, letting things go, not holding on to that stuff that's toxic and makes us feel ill. Looking at and savouring happy memories, showing gratitude and also, you know, making sure that we really um, think about other people at this time. So three kind acts, three things we can do for others and remembering the good things on a daily basis, just simple positive psychology activities. And also, I think we need to factor into this kindness, the way in which we speak to children and young people, what our narratives are like here. And sometimes I think we've got to think very carefully, what are we saying? When, what are we using? What are our phrases for calming an anxious or traumatised child? Because our language and our tone really does matter here. So first of all, I think it has to be safety. Safety first. I'm here for you. I'm staying here. You're going to be all right. You're going to be OK. Then physiology. We've got to actually help them to see that it's going to pass. Your body is responding in an anxious way. Give it a minute or two. It's going to go. It will pass. You've been through it before. You can do this again. So that whole kind of solution focus, strengths finding approach and then validation, being very clear. This must be so hard. I'm sorry it's making you feel nervous having to come back in the classroom. It sounds like you want to talk it through. It's not silly. You feel like this. It matters. I can see you're worried. How can I help you right now? So again, what is our narrative? Our language and our tone matters. So making reference back to emotion coaching, really, really, really important. We all know how to use emotion coaching. It should be part of our real toolbox for well-being now at this stage, at this part part of the, the pandemic when we're transitioning children and young people back. The Essential Resilience and Wellbeing Toolkit for early years has a lot, uh, a, quite a big section on emotion coaching. There's also our flag up the resource from Nurture UK again. And I think we need to actually ensure that we do this. We need to be able to support children, to recognise their feelings. We need to validate them with them. We don't need to dismiss them and we need to help them to process them and to recognise how to problem solve effectively. And since the last time I actually recorded one of these, um, thankfully, the Toolbox of Wellbeing has been published. So I'm going to talk a little bit about this now because I think that in essence, people feel overwhelmed. I talked to a teacher two weeks ago who said, I just feel overwhelmed. There's so much stuff out there. There's so much talk about what we should be doing, how we can do it. She said, I just want one little thing that I can pick up and use. So that also, alongside hearing the little boy talk um, on the walk in the early morning walk with his mum and saying how, how frightened he was, didn't want to go out, didn't want her to go to work. I really did think, what, what is it that a parent, a teacher, a TA, LSA, um, just anybody, a child, a young person would want to, to just pick up and use and say, look, this is full of really helpful things that I can do now. 
in order to protect my well-being and really ensure that I can manage to engage in post-trauma growth here. So I've produced this little book of, it's a, we call it a toolbox of well-being, but it's a little book of really useful strategies and activities for children, teens and us as their parents, carers, nurturers. And the impetus really for this was, was clear. There's never been a time, I think, when knowing how to manage our own well-being and how to support our children in doing this has been so vital. It's an absolute essential. So this is a must have book, I think. In my view, it's, it's really full of easy to use activities that build emotional well-being in all children and young people. And I would love to see this as part of the response that schools are making in developing their recovery curriculum in the light of the COVID-19 pandemic. In a sense, it's providing us with user friendly, easy to understand. I've demystified it. I've taken some of the larger psychological terms out and I, there's lots and lots of practical support and ideas for parents and carers and teachers at the start of this as to how they can actually manage this situation and how they can engage themselves in post trauma growth. And I think it's really about building the resilience that we all need to move on from this including the sort of trauma that we are experiencing currently or have previously experienced in lockdown related to this pandemic. And it was a, an immediate neighbour of mine here who is also a teacher who said to me, thanks so much. I showed her the PDF of this and she had a good old read and said, you know, this is exactly what I needed. It's like a wee paperback. I can pop it in my handbag and I can read it on the train going into work, which is a lot better than actually reading the newspaper at the current time, which is just making me more anxious. So hopefully this is going to be something really, really user friendly. The activities in the book are divided into sections for younger children, teenagers, and whole groups or classes and they're grouped under three key trauma recovery approaches. Self-regulate for well-being, get moving mentally and physically for well-being and connect for well-being. So it's very, very logically set out. So it's very, very easy to use. And again, the real key impetus here is to ensure that all of us, adults and children alike, understand the need for us all to engage in these three trauma recovery approaches. So in part one, self-regulate for well-being, there are activities which focus on identifying and modulating emotions, controlling impulses, delaying gratification, making thoughtful and conscious choices and setting realistic goals that we can achieve. So that whole focus is on self-regulation. And I do ask in the in the intro for, for you to think about how we are or are not modelling this effectively. We know that emotional self-control is based mainly on our, bit, our ability to calm down in the face of anger and frustration. We know that cognitive self-regulation boils down to our problem solving abilities. And then, of course, there's social self-control, which is our capacity to refrain from just saying whatever pops into our bright brains, especially when what we thought isn't particularly helpful or kind or negative. My dad always used to say to me, if you've got nothing good to say, keep your mouth shut, actually. And I think that this is really at this time so, so important that these three key elements, are we modelling these things to our children because they need us to do this um, really um, at this point in time. And all these slides, this is taken directly from the book. So everything that I'm showing now on the, the slides related to these three key areas um, of well-being, I think you, you will find in the book. So five ways for adults to self-regulate. And I put simple with an exclamation mark because I think um, sometimes it's not. And we know that and we have to just kind of recognise that, you know, this is a job, a lifelong job, really. We've got to keep working at this. It's like emotional literacy. We never totally get there. We have to keep going. It's a journey. Breathing deeply when we're stressed, it's a natural human response to take these short, shallow breaths. So this is really important. Just stop for a moment. Take three to ten really slow, deep breaths. This is exactly what the children are being asked to do. So I'm asking the adults to do it too. We need to drink more water. We know our nervous systems are far more sensitive when we're dehydrated. Um, so we need to stay hydrated. There's a reason why we give kids the opportunity to drink water throughout the school day and we need to be doing it too. And sometimes as adults, we forget this. 
pausing, just taking a moment to pause and center ourselves, placing your hand over your heart, practicing that just throughout the day and to interrupt the day with this. Think, recall what you love about the child or young person or a successful experience you've had with them. What that does is it releases positive neurotransmitters to balance out negative brain chemicals which are produced by frustration and stress. And this is such an optimistic point to make because it's a fact that we can self-regulate our own nervous systems. So let's do this a little bit more. Let's be visualizing, recalling, going back, anchoring ourselves into those wonderful opportunities and times that we had with these children so that we repeat that feel good factor and we can begin to self-regulate our own nervous systems more effectively. And linked to that, of course, is this visualizing Doing this on a daily basis, seeing the positive outcome, practicing visualisation, it's a hugely, immensely powerful and effective tool. And sometimes I think it's underestimated. And these are some of the activities for, for children, making the calm down jar. So mixing glitter dew with hot water, adding a few drops of food colouring, whisking it all together. And these are just the instructions. So this is one example and they're, they're such fun and, and kids love making these, particularly little ones. So the 54321 method, again, this is a pause moment, working back with some five, using your senses to list things you notice around you. It's a grounding exercise. So you might start by listing five things you hear, then four things you see, three things you can touch from where you're sitting, two that you can smell, and one thing you can taste. So it's about noticing the little things that you can really pay attention to. Mindfulness. And visualization, another activity from the toolbox. Imagine yourself leaving the painful feelings behind. So gathering the emotions, scrunching them up, putting them in a box, walking, swimming, biking, or jogging away from those painful feelings. Imagining your thoughts as a song or TV program you just like, changing the channel or turning down the volume. They're still there, but you don't have to listen to them. Again, a key tool, set of key tools from the toolbox. And part two, is get, get moving mentally and physically for well-being. And this is really, really important. The mental agility in analysing and challenging our negative automatic thinking patterns. So I call them NATS, negative automatic thoughts. And they need to be agile physically also in order to produce those feel-good chemicals in the brain are really the focus of this next section of this little book. One of the activities is around recognising thinking errors. So when are we engaging in these thinking errors, doing ourselves down, blowing things up or catastrophizing, making them, them worse than they really are, predicting failure or fortune telling, over emotional thoughts, setting yourself up. So setting your targets that are far too high so you know you're going to fail or just blaming yourself, thinking that everything goes wrong um, because it's your fault. So again, a simple activity, but also then going on to thinking about how we challenge these, how we recognize, how we pick them out and how we challenge them and we make them more effective. So it's not as simple as changing a, posit a negative to a positive. That's very simplistic. It's about changing something ineffective to something effective. And this is a key tool from the toolbox. Physical fitness and being in nature, obviously, that's the other element of this mental and physical fitness. And I think this is absolutely essential. Kids need to be engaged in physical activity. So do we. It lowers our anxiety. We know it has a positive impact on mental health because it produces the chemicals that we need which help us to regulate our emotions and relieve those stress and anxiety experiences that we are having because basically it reduces the, the hormone cortisol in, in our brains. But also for children as well, it's important to top off up on vitamin D, being outside, being out, outdoors, because that releases serotonin. And again, that is what helps to regulate our emotions and moods. And having worry time, we, we have to acknowledge that we do get worries, we, we, we get anxious. And sometimes I think it's important for children just to be able to sit down and have that little bit of worry time and think, OK, when I've done this, I'm going to stop or I'm going to put them off for later or, or I'm going to write them down. and I'm going to go and talk to someone about them afterwards. This is another tool that we present to the. Also. Also, there is the anxiety ladder, and this again is an, another tool that they can make use of, and it is included, obviously, in the toolbox. And this is about actually facing fears and, and identifying gentle steps to actually being able to overcome that fear ultimately. 
I do this a lot with children who are school phobic, who have anxiety disorders around social anxiety as well, particularly, but also separation anxiety. So drawing a ladder with 10 or more steps, writing down all the gentle, easy steps they think they could take one at a time in order to face and then ultimately conquer that fear. So again, starting with the easiest or the least feared up to the most feared or the hardest thing. And what actually happens here for children and young people and for us, I think, as adults, is that we'll build up good evidence over time that it's OK to be with that feared object or to, to cope with that particular situation. Fears are not there forever and we can do something about them. We can gain a certain level of control or autonomy. And that's what we need to focus on more than ever at this time. And another strategy, I call it ACT. So there are many ways of managing emotions and boosting well-being and self-esteem. So we can place them under three headings, active ones, calming ones and thinking ones. And what I ask the children to do in the activity is to think about what they can do for each one right now, what they could do more of, and then to keep a diary, what I call an act diary for a week, to, to think about what worked well, which, which tools and strategies they use the most, mo which help them the most, the active ones, the calming ones, the thinking ones. Then part three of the book is connect for well-being and this is really really important we know connections matter those strong ties those meaningful empathic nurturing relationships we have with our friends families within our community they are the things that give us those relationships give us the happiness security and support and a sense of purpose that we all need as human beings it's so important this being connected to others for our mental health and our physical well-being too and this, these can be a real protective factor against anxiety and depression we know that human beings are generally social animals we thrive for that level of connection and love and strong and meaningful interactions with others and we know from the research from the neuroscience that our brain activates pain centers when we're at risk of becoming isolated and trauma recovery one key element of that has to be connection connecting with other people so building positive relationships has this contagious effect and in turn offers us support in these difficult times we want the right kind of contagion here particularly during this awful pandemic so part of that connection here one of the activities that um, is emphasized in in the toolbox is this notion of developing reliving revisualizing savoring happy memories and it's really important for us now more than ever to support children and young people to understand that happy memories are an important part of maintaining our well-being so we can introduce them to the idea that they may find it helpful to think about happy memories lovely times good times when they're finding things rough or tough or they're getting anxious so lots of us do this. I do it myself. And I think making a happy memories box or book maybe would also be helpful. And this is something that children can use at home. They can keep a diary at home. They can make their happy memories box at home. And another strategy from the toolbox is around practicing three kind acts. And I um, do this myself. This is my daily practice in terms of positive psychology. I've absolutely firmly believe in it so practicing this every day doing things for other people ensuring that they can feel happy and loved and they really do count these tiny things just writing a wee note giving a message helping out making a small gift and I encourage children to keep diaries in which they record these kind acts and reflect on them at the end of every week. How do they feel about this now? How do they feel their kind acts have impacted upon others? There's something very powerful about going out there and doing good and being kind to other people. Um, and I would say that doing good helps us to, to feel good. So ultimately, three kind acts is a lovely strategy that all children, young people and us as adults can use on a daily basis. And in this third section of the little book, I also really highlight the fact that social media is not all negative. Used in the right way, it can help us. You know, there are lots of lovely calm, harm apps, etc., etc., out there that can help to support us in uh, regulating our emotions and engaging in, in more um, effective thinking. But also just in terms of, you know, interacting with each other. One of the activities here is around keeping in touch with friends, posting things to make them feel better about themselves and share good advice. So nothing negative. And I've asked them to create a kind messages WhatsApp group. What will you post? What will you share? 
So I just think that's a lovely idea in terms of actually turning this on its head. We talk a lot about the negative aspects of social media. Let, let's use it now to do what we need to do more than ever, which is build these positive, meaningful connections so that we nurture and support each other at this time. So just to flag back here um, and re-emphasise the point that we need more than ever to understand the impact of trauma and anxiety on our children and young people, which is why I've produced two CPD coffee times in this series, one focusing on anxiety and one focusing on trauma. Vital that we understand this so that we can really build a trauma-informed nurturing recovery curriculum for our children and young people and our teams and our staff members as we transition back into schools over the coming months. So some key takeaway messages from today. Ultimately, when we're talking about a recovery curriculum and developing this, we need to ensure that our children and young people feel safe. We know from the neuroscience the impact of trauma and anxiety on the brain, on the way in which working memory functions or rather doesn't function. And we know that children and young people who are unregulated will not learn. They need to be in a safe context and to feel safe and to feel nurtured. They need to have structure. They need to, to know that the adults around them are nurturing, they're safe adults, and they are building secure, empathic relationships with them. As adults as well, I think it's really, really vital that we understand and know and have really learned how to manage the outcomes of possible trauma experiences in our own past. That's absolutely essential so that we're not putting ourselves at risk of vicarious trauma. We also need to be very clear that we avoid re-traumatising children by focusing on the negatives at this time. There are going to be opportunities for this and sometimes individualised opportunities when children need to come and offload and talk through some of their anxieties. But I actually do think that we need to be careful that we don't focus on the negatives too much here. We need to be focusing on positives, positive memories, positive times, positive emotions at this point in time so that children feel safe and nurtured and happy to be back in school. We also need to start, I think, with what actually helped us to cope during lockdown. What were our strengths? What were we using? What were our social networks? How did we do this? What resources did we use both inwardly and outwardly? Also highlighting the fact that although we're physically distant, we can still be emotionally connected to each other. And also ensuring that those who are the most vulnerable, and I, I did say this at the outset of the presentation at the beginning, that there are going to be those children who've experienced very, very bad um, elements of, of trauma and anxiety during this lockdown period. And I think that's very, very important that we ensure they get the right support, a bespoke individualised programme at the outset. And also, I think thinking about this as being... Uh, the real opportunity here, and I do think it's an opportunity for us to do it differently. Finally, understanding the, the neuroscience, finally understanding the importance of knowing about a trauma informed, trauma sensitive approaches and how the brain works and the impact of trauma on our children, young people's behaviour and ability to learn and function and develop and maintain relationships. We need to be trauma sensitive, trauma informed. It needs to underpin the way in which we connect with children and the way in which we teach them and support them in the classroom context. And that really does essentially mean knowing how to attune with them, knowing how to use emotion coaching, knowing how to recognise and support them to self-soothe and self-calm and regulate. So it's about doing it differently. We need to move away from some of these old behaviourist approaches. We know they don't work, they never did work, and we need to replace them now by trauma-sensitive classrooms and practice and nurture for all our children and young people. And a final takeaway message from me here, I suppose now, is that we also need to embed these three trauma recovery approaches from the toolbox for wellbeing, toolbox of wellbeing, into our recovery plan for the school, both at a systems level, so across the systems, how we 
greeting, meeting, all the different policies that we're making. We need to be thinking this about embedding this far more deeply now, these trauma recovery approaches, but also at a curriculum level, how we are teaching, how we are nurturing our children and what we are doing in terms of developing this emotional literacy and this ability that they have to self-regulate, how we are increasing capacity for that for our children and young, young people. So self-regulating for well-being, getting moving mentally and physically for well-being and connecting for well-being. How are we incorporating that and ensuring that it underpins our well-being curriculum and systems in our schools? And finally, remember, and this is not just about me pushing my own stuff here, there's so much out there in terms of resources already. But I, I do think it's important that people don't feel they have to keep recreating the wheel. Um, and at a time when there is an increased level of stress for many of us, I think sometimes it's really helpful just to have something you can say, I know this is going to work. I know these are really useful key tools and strategies. So thank you once again for listening. And I hope that this session today has given you lots of ideas, lots of food for thought, but lots of practical tools and strategies, things that you can simply take away now and you could possibly use now or tomorrow or next week with the child or young person that you're currently working with or with your smaller group of children in your bubble. So thank you once again and hopefully you'll join me for the next one.